This episode was suggested by a listener, Rebecca T., on our website. If you'd like to suggest a topic or just say hi, you can do so on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast, on Twitter at Morbid Podcast, or on our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. Interest in these disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. Humans have a tendency to dispose of their dead in a way that hides them from sight, be it burial, cremation, or otherwise. Exposed human remains are considered taboo, and the only time they are seen in large numbers is on the battlefield or at the site of a massive tragedy. Even then, they are usually removed and buried afterwards. It's considered respectful to the deceased and their families. What if I told you there is a place where this social code has fallen by the wayside, where the bodies of the dead lie exposed for decades and are passed over by hundreds of people every year and even used as a way of navigating the landscape? That place is the Rainbow Valley on the high slopes of Mount Everest, and it is the final resting place for those who have died attempting to climb the tallest, most unforgiving mountain in the world. Mount Everest is part of the Himalayan mountain range. It sits just on the border of Nepal and Tibet, with the summit within the boundaries of Nepal. The mountain is 60 million years old and created from the movement of three geological formations. To this day, the summit is said to rise four millimeters per year due to the continuing movement of those tectonic plates, but this is more recently under scrutiny. The summit of Everest is the highest point above sea level on the Earth's surface, and therefore it is known as the highest mountain in the world. However, there are several other mountains that are taller when measuring from their base to their summit, such as Mauna Kea in Hawaii and Denali in Alaska. Mount Everest is known as Sagarmatha by the Nepalese, which means Mother of the Universe. The Tibetans know it as Chomolongma, which means Holy Mother. The area around the mountain has been inhabited since 80 BCE, when the Kirata people lived in the lower mountains. The Sherpa people now live near the base of Mount Everest and in the surrounding Himalaya mountains. The first map that included the mountain was made in 1715 by the Qing Empire, the last imperial dynasty of China. In 1802, the British began the Great Trigonomic Survey of India in order to map the Indian subcontinent, which was at the time dotted with British colonial territories. In 1849, Andrew Waugh noted the tallest peak in the Himalayas as Peak 15. Using trigonometry, Peak 15 was calculated as the highest mountain in the entire world in 1956. The current measurement sits at 8,848 meters, or 29,029 feet, above sea level. Because there were many local names for the peak, Waugh named it Everest, after Sir George Everest, his predecessor in the position of Surveyor General of India. Since it was named the highest mountain in the world, Everest has attracted adventurers and climbers who are willing to risk life and limb to reach its summit. When I say life and limb, I'm not exaggerating. With average temperatures in the negative Celsius or near zero Fahrenheit, the risk of frostbite is high. Frostbite occurs when exposed skin freezes and ice crystals form inside the tissue, causing damage at the cellular level. The symptoms are numbness in the area, blistering, blue-gray discoloration of the skin, 
and finally blackening and mummification of the destroyed tissues. If frostbite reaches this point, usually the area will have to be amputated, as the tissue has died. People have lost entire limbs to frostbite. On top of the deathly low temperature, gale force winds are constantly tearing across all sides of the mountain. Winds strong enough to blow climbers off the mountain completely. These winds are slightly less strong in the months of May and June during a break in the monsoon season, which is why most climbers attempt Everest in these months. Avalanches and storms are also common and have caused multiple deaths many times over the years. Even more dangerous, Mount Everest is so tall, so high altitude, that the air is very thin, meaning it is oxygen poor, especially above 8,000 meters or 26,000 feet, where the peak actually extends into the stratosphere, the second layer of the Earth's atmosphere. This altitude is known as the death zone due to the low oxygen levels and the high winds. The human body needs oxygen to function properly, and without that oxygen, many life-threatening health issues can occur, such as hypoxia, in which the tissues of the body become deprived of oxygen, causing fatigue, nausea, confusion, disorientation, blackouts, and sometimes hallucinations, brain damage, and death. Another two conditions that can occur at high altitude are high altitude pulmonary edema, or HAPE, and high altitude cerebral edema, or HACE. HAPE is a life-threatening accumulation of fluid in the lungs, which basically drowns the victim. HACE is a condition where the brain swells with fluid. This causes disorientation, nausea, fever, the feeling of being drunk, altered mental state, and loss of consciousness. The eyes are also affected as the pupils dilate, and the victim may suffer ocular paralysis. Retinal hemorrhages, which cause blindness, are another hazard that can affect climbers due to the high altitude. These symptoms and conditions can be relieved somewhat by bottled oxygen, which most climbers use once they enter the death zone. However, they cannot be completely relieved, and the climbers still suffer from utter exhaustion and weakness thanks to the high altitude. A climber of Everest must deal with all of this while also climbing the mountain. There are many routes to reach the summit, but the most popular are the Northern Ridge Route and the Southern Ridge Route. Both routes involve scaling steep ridges with almost vertical drop-offs on both sides and continuous climbing for entire days, all while dealing with the effects of the cold, the altitude, and the wind. The Northern Ridge Route begins in Tibet, at base camp on a gravel plain just below the Rongbuk Glacier at an altitude of 5,180 meters or 16,990 feet above sea level. Climbers ascend to Camp 2 at 6,100 meters or 20,000 feet via a ridge of rock at the base of the Changtze Mountain, another mountain just north of Everest. They then climb up the glacier to the foot of the North Coal a high-altitude mountain pass to Camp 3 at 6,500 meters, or 21,300 feet. Fixed ropes then lead the climbers to Camp 4 on the North Coal at 7,010 meters, or 23,000 feet. Traversing across the rocky North Ridge gets the climbers to Camp 5 at about 7,775 meters, or 25,500 feet. The route then becomes a diagonal climb crossing the north face to Camp 6 at 8,230 meters or 27,000 feet above sea level and well into the death zone. From this camp, climbers have limited time to reach the summit and must face a set of treacherous ridges using a ladder that has been in place since 1975. The pyramid-shaped summit is then reached after climbing a steep snow slope. The climbers must then descend the same way they came up making sure to be back below 8,000 meters within 48 hours or suffer from oxygen deprivation. This northern route was closed to Westerners in 1950 after China took control over Tibet, but was reopened in 1980. It is almost as popular as the southern ridge route, but it's difficult to get a permit to climb, thus preventing many expeditions from Tibet. 
The Southern Ridge Route begins in Nepal on the south side of Everest. Base camp sits on the Khumbu Glacier at 5,380 meters or 17,700 feet above sea level. It takes between six and eight days to hike to base camp, which actually helps with acclimating to the altitude. Most people stay at base camp for a few weeks to assist with this as well. To get to Camp 1, which sits at 6,065 meters or 19,900 feet, climbers must cross the Kumbu Icefall, an ever-shifting field of enormous ice blocks full of crevasses that may open up at any time. This is one of the most dangerous parts of the route. Most climbers begin traversing it before dawn, when the freezing night temperatures keep the blocks frozen together. To ascend to Camp 2, Climbers must cross a snowy high-altitude valley split by a large crevasse, called the Western Coombe. This area is also known as the Valley of Silence, as it's the most protected from the wind and can be quite hot on a sunny day. Camp 3 is reached by using fixed ropes to ascend the Lutzi face, the face of the neighboring mountain, to the South Col, a mountain pass between Everest and Lutzi. Camp 3 sits on a small ledge at 7,470 meters, or 24,500 feet. Another 500 meters up and across the South Col is Camp 4, which sits in the death zone. Keep in mind, thanks to the effects of the high altitude and the freezing cold, it takes even the most acclimated climbers up to 12 hours to walk 1.7 k, or around 1 mile, while in the death zone. From Camp 4 to the summit, climbers must cross the southern ridge of Everest, a thin vertical strip of rock and ice exposed to high winds. One wrong step could send a climber 2,400 meters, or 7,900 feet, down the southwest face to their death. The final push to the summit is usually started near midnight, with hopes of reaching the summit at noon. This is done in order to avoid being in darkness or running out of oxygen during the descent back to Camp 4. I'll put a route map on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram so you can all see these routes. It's pretty intimidating. A variation of this southern route is the way the very first successful climbers of Mount Everest went. There were many attempts to climb Everest before anyone reached the summit, however. In 1921, George Mallory, an English mountaineer, and Guy Bullock, a British diplomat, explored the slopes of Everest and made it to 7,005 meters, or 22,982 feet, but were not equipped to climb any higher. They did, however, plan a route to the summit via the North Col. In 1922, George Finch, an Australian chemist and mountaineer, made record time when he ascended the slopes of Everest at around 290 meters, or 9,051 feet per hour. He was the first to use bottled oxygen to deal with the thin air, and made it to 8,320 meters, or 27,300 feet. In that same year, Mallory made a second attempt that ended in an avalanche and the death of seven Sherpas. Determined, Mallory tried again in 1924, but weather conditions forced him to abort his first attempt. He acquired some oxygen tanks for one last attempt and chose 22-year-old Andrew Irvine, another English mountaineer, as his partner. They attempted to summit via the northern route, but never returned. In May 1999, Mallory's body was found in a snow basin near Camp 4. Irvine has yet to be found. It is not known if they reached the summit or not. The first recorded successful summit of Mount Everest was that of Sir Edmund Hillary, a mountaineer from New Zealand, and Tenzing Norgay, a Nepali Sherpa mountaineer from India, in 1953. Their success was celebrated around the globe, and annual ceremonies still occur in schools and offices in Nepal to celebrate their achievement. Since Hillary and Norgay, many people have successfully climbed Everest, 4,833 in fact, some of them summiting more than once. Many more have attempted and given up, finding the risk to be too great. Sadly, many who have accepted the risks of climbing this unforgiven peak have died in the process, usually during their descent after reaching the summit. Mount Everest has claimed the lives of 288 people since 1953, and it continues to do so to this day.
Because the mountain is so dangerous to climb, removing the deceased remains of those that have died is fraught with difficulty and peril to those who attempt it. Other climbers risk their own lives attempting to lift, drag, or otherwise move an incapacitated or dead climber. Removal by helicopter risks the pilot's life and in turn any passengers they might carry, as the pilot is not acclimated to the thin air and may pass out because of it. There are also no safe areas to land, and the high winds increase the risk of crashing. Most of these remains are left where they fall, lying in the most dangerous part of the mountain, the death zone. Rainbow Valley sits just below the summit of Mount Everest and gets its name thanks to the brightly colored down jackets that adorn the many corpses that lie scattered across the valley. Before we discuss the stories of the residents of the Rainbow Valley, let's hear from our sponsors. Our regular sponsor is Audible.com. If you're always on the go or just too busy to sit down and read, you can still enjoy a good book with Audible.com. There are over 180,000 audiobooks to choose from, which you can listen to on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 player. MCP listeners can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of Audible.com by going to www.audibletrial.com mcp. You can also find the link on our Facebook page and website. If you sign up for the free trial, you get a free audiobook that is yours to keep, even if you cancel the service. And the MCP gets the funding it needs to keep bringing morbid history to your ears. Another great sponsor is Better World Books. Better World Books has low prices on new, used, and rare books, as well as textbooks. With locations in both the U.S. and the U.K., Better World can ship anywhere in the world for free, with no minimum purchase. More importantly, when you buy books from Better World, you help fund literacy. For every book sold, Better World donates a book to someone in need. Better World also helps to fund educational nonprofits and libraries. To access these great deals and help fund literacy, go to bit.ly slash mcpbooksus for the U.S. store and bit.ly slash mcpbooksuk for the U.K. store. That's bit.ly slash mcpbooksus and bit.ly slash mcpbooksuk. Our last sponsor is ThinkGeek, the premier retailer for the global geek community. Express your love of Marvel, Star Trek, Dungeons & Dragons, Fallout, Skyrim, and more with clever t-shirts and other unique apparel, home and office decor, electronics, collectibles, and much more. I got my Legend of Zelda Hylian Shield backpack from ThinkGeek, and I'm in love with it. In fact, their Zelda collection is massive, and I believe we shared a link to it on our Facebook page. Think Geek has great gifts whether you're into science or science fiction, and many of the items sold there you won't find anywhere else. Just follow our link, bit.ly slash morbidgeek, to search their extensive collection of geeky gear. That's bit.ly slash morbidgeek. Remember, when you buy using our links, you support the MCP. Thank you. And now, back to the episode. It is said that over 150 bodies lie on the slopes of Everest due to the hazards of climbing it. The Rainbow Valley, located just below the summit on the Northeast Ridge route, contains a high concentration of human remains, and the death zone in general contains the most. However, there are remains at many of the camps at lower altitudes, embedded in the icefall, and along the main trails below 8,000 meters. Most Sherpa deaths occur at lower altitudes, such as on the icefall, while the high-altitude deaths consist of almost all people who have paid to climb the mountain, and the Western guides they paid to help them. I'd like to tell the stories of a few of the people who left behind the most notable remains, in this context notable meaning well-known by other climbers of Everest due to their position on the trail, the tragic circumstances of their deaths, or their place in Everest history. Please remember that these are people who left families behind, families who may or may not be upset by the fact that the remains of their loved ones still lay exposed on the slopes of Mount Everest, or that images of those remains have circulated on the internet. To us, these remains are interesting. To them, they are a constant reminder of someone they have lost, 
please keep that loss in mind. As I mentioned in the first half of the podcast, George Mallory and Andrew Irvine went missing during their climb along the North Ridge in 1924. Mallory's remains were finally found and identified in 1999 on the Northeast Ridge at 8,157 meters, or 26,760 feet. His body lies face down, with sections of his coat torn away or disintegrated, exposing his back. His body is well-preserved and mummified due to the cold and dry air, as were several personal artifacts which identified him beyond any doubt as George Mallory. Thanks to modern forensic techniques, what happened to Mallory is no longer a mystery. It appears he and Irvine were roped together when one of them slipped. This is indicated by a rope jerk injury around Mallory's wrist. Mallory lies 300 meters down from where Irvine's ice axe was discovered, but does not have the injuries of someone who fell that far. His right leg was broken, but his own axe was found near his body, indicating he must have caught himself at some point during his fall. However, he does have a golf ball-sized puncture wound in his forehead, which was likely the cause of his death. The wound is similar in size to the end of an ice axe, and it is thought that perhaps as he caught himself, his axe bounced off a particularly hard rock and into his skull. Mallory's remains were covered after an Anglican funeral service was performed. In 1979, Hannelore Schmatz, a German mountaineer, was returning from the summit via the Southern Ridge route when she collapsed. She had been on an expedition with her husband and American climber Ray Gennett. Exhausted, she and Gennett stopped to bivouac or create an improvised shelter, despite the urging of their Sherpa guides to keep moving. Both she and Gennett died as night fell. One Sherpa, Sangdara, stayed with Schmatz's body until morning and lost most of his fingers and toes to frostbite because of it. Gennett's body soon disappeared under the snow, but Schmatz was swept further down the mountain by high winds. She came to a stop at about 100 meters above Camp 4. For years, her remains, frozen in a reclining position against her pack, with her eyes open and hair blowing in the wind, could be seen by everyone who attempted the Southern Ridge route. In 1984, two people fell to their deaths while trying to recover Schmatz's body. Eventually, the high winds blew her remains over the edge of the mountain and out of sight, but not before she became a landmark to hundreds of climbers who attempted the final push to the summit. Another person whose remains have become a well-known landmark is Tse Wang Paljor, whose remains were nicknamed Green Boots, thanks to the neon green boots he wore. These boots used to stick out onto the trail from the cave his body lay in at 8,500 meters, and hundreds of climbers stepped over it on their way to the summit for over 20 years. His remains were moved further into the cave at one point so that the feet were not on the trail, but recently his body has disappeared, most likely moved out of sight by other climbers. This came as great relief to his family, who were devastated by the many images of him taken by other climbers. His death, as well as the death of seven others, occurred in 1996, when an intense and out-of-season blizzard struck the mountain. Paljor was headed for the summit along the Southern Ridge route, with Dorje Morup and Sewing Smanla, who were all part of the Indo-Tibet border police. The three men had made it to the summit, and were on their way down when the blizzard hit. It appears Paljor got separated from his companions and crawled into the cave for shelter. It isn't known if he survived the night, but it is said that several climbers passed him the next morning and thought he had just stopped to rest, or perhaps they thought he was already dead. Either way, there he died, his last moments forever frozen for all to see. Seven other climbers died that day, including Robert Hall, who went back to help the rest of his team descend. This event has been documented by several of the climbers who survived in the form of books. One of the best sellers was Into Thin Air by John Krakauer, a journalist who documented his experience of the storm, although his account received a lot of bad press for criticizing another climber and guide, Anatoly Borkreev. Borkreev, who was also there in 1996 and saved the lives of several of his team, wrote his own account entitled The Climb. 
I recommend either of these if you want to know more about this tragic event. In 1998, Frances Arsentiev and her husband, Sergei, became separated during their descent from the summit. It was growing dark when Frances collapsed while looking for Sergei, who, unbeknownst to her, had fallen to his death. Frances was found by two climbers at 8,850 meters. They stayed with her for a few hours, but had to descend without her or risk their own lives. They left her, hearing cries of don't leave me ringing in their ears. She died that night, and her body lay on the side of a steep cliff along the main route of the summit for nine years, visible to all who went to the summit. The climbers that left her, Ian Woodall and Kathy O'Dowd, felt so guilty that in 2007, they went back to Everest to move her body. They had trouble finding her at first, but when they did, they attempted to build a cairn of rocks over her body, but sadly, there weren't enough movable rocks. Instead, they wrapped her remains in an American flag and lowered them over the edge. Woodhall, however, hadn't contacted Frances' son about what he was doing, but her son was grateful he would no longer have to see new images of her online. Woodall's efforts did not go unrecognized. Paldor's family contacted Woodall about moving his body. Woodall said he spent about $70,000 moving Francis, and that he couldn't afford to move another body without funding. It's not known who moved Paljor, but in 2014, he and the remains of many others were moved out of sight. Only two or three are now visible near the summit on the southern side. In 2005, Marko Litanaker, a Slovenian mountaineer, died during his descent at around 8,800 meters. He was last seen having problems with his oxygen tank. He did not have a spare, as he had left it at a lower altitude to pick up on the way back down. He was also climbing alone. Apparently, some climbers stopped to help, but he was too far gone by that point. He was found dead and frozen in place on the main trail by two Chinese porters. The image of his remains is one of many that have circulated online, thanks to climbers taking pictures while they climb. In 2017, a group of Russian mountaineers trekked into the death zone to perform a funeral for Litenacker. They covered his body in a white tarp so that it was no longer visible. Their expedition was called Everest 8300. One of the more controversial deaths was that of David Sharp, whose remains sat just next to Paljors in a cave at 8,500 meters. He had previously attempted Everest twice, losing several toes to frostbite in the process, but never reached the summit. In 2006, Sharp had decided to climb without extra oxygen, without a radio, and completely alone. It is not known if he reached the summit, but he sought shelter in the cave on one of the coldest nights of the climbing season. Many groups of climbers had noticed him slowly climbing alone, but had continued on their own attempts at the summit. It's likely Sharp was suffering some degree of altitude sickness. It's likely he sat down to rest and was unable to get up again. Many more climbers passed him, missing him in the darkness, thinking he was just another dead body, or determining that he was beyond help and moving on. During their descent the next day, some of these same climbers stopped to help, realizing that Sharp was alive. But Sharp was unable to move and the climbers, who were weak themselves and running out of oxygen, left him, some intent on returning with more oxygen. Sharp ultimately died, his body frozen in an upright fetal position in the same cave as Paljor. While Sharp's fate was mostly due to his own decisions, his fellow climbers were severely criticized by the media for not helping him more. Many more unidentified remains lie on the slopes of Everest, skeletonized or mummified by the harsh environment. Thanks to global warming causing the snow to melt, many more remains have been revealed in recent years, and there has been a lot of discussion and some action taken on trying to remove some of these remains. As I mentioned, in 2014, many of the remains in the death zone mysteriously disappeared. It is thought that the Chinese Tibetan Mountaineering Association or the Chinese Mountaineering Association, are behind the removals. These two groups manage Everest's north side, 
and Dawa Stephen Sherpa, another proponent of the clearing of Everest slopes of both garbage and human remains, stated that they don't tell people what they're doing. They don't want publicity. There's an ongoing controversy surrounding leaving behind those climbers who can't continue. A climber's code of ethics specifies that helping others is more important than summiting a mountain, but this does not seem to be the case on Everest. There's more of a self-preserving mentality, as might be expected in such a dangerous environment, but sometimes this breaches into the realm of the inhumane. It's true there is a great risk in stopping to help others. On Everest, humans are physically limited both by the altitude and lack of resources, and just sitting with a dying climber and being with them in their last moments can be risky, but there's also putting the summit of a mountain above another human life. There's an almost obsessive drive for many climbers to reach the summit, a kind of high-altitude hubris called summit fever, in which the climber will stop at nothing, risking their own life as well as other climbers in order to make it to the summit. This mentality could be part of the effects of altitude, which does affect the climber's judgment and reasoning skills, but other factors include the pressures of spending a large amount of money to climb Everest and the idea that they may never have another opportunity. Tens of thousands of dollars and weeks of effort are thrown to the wayside if they stop to help another climber instead of summiting the mountain. This mentality can also lead to increased risk of their own life, as many put such effort into reaching the summit that they save no energy for their descent, creating more climbers in need of assistance that may be passed over by others who have the same hubris. There's an excellent documentary on this subject by National Geographic called The Dark Side of Everest, if you're interested. I highly recommend it as it does an excellent job of detailing both the risks associated with helping other climbers and the ethics of why it's still important to do so. Another good one is a Nova documentary called The Death Zone. Both can be found on YouTube. Reaching the summit of Mount Everest seems to be at the edge of human ability. Not only that, the mountain also seems to reach deep into the fabric of human morality, making it the ultimate test, one that quite often ends in death. The way it lays bare our own mortality and forces us to consider what makes us human is why it brings out the curiosity in us. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show at Morbid Podcast or find us on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media and give us a rating on iTunes. Thank you to Wes, Ellen, Tez, Jessica, and James for their comments and messages on Facebook. Thank you to Adam and Amber for their messages via our website. And thank you to Casey for her message and Pontifax, a papal history podcast, for the shout-out on Twitter. Thank you, Neville, for your comments on YouTube. Thank you to Sean for your review on iTunes and to NS Devar on Podbean for the comment. By the way, we're on Podbean now. Thank you so much to Alan Arnett, who has climbed Everest and answered a few of my questions about it for this episode. He has a great website and blog about climbing Everest. You should check it out if you're interested. It's alanarnett.com. And finally, a huge thank you to James and Kevin for their large donations. Your kind words warmed our creepy little hearts. Thanks to you, the listeners, our creepy community is growing. The MCP is part of a wider creepy community known as the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out the other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. If you like the show, why not support the MCP with a donation? Your gifts go to the research materials we use to create this podcast. If you'd like to donate, you can go to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. There you'll find a donation button, links to all our social media, and other ways to contact us. If you're feeling extra generous, you can set up a monthly donation there as well. Your donations help us keep the podcast going. Another way to help is to check out our sponsors, audible.com, thinkgeek, and Better World Books. Those links will be posted on the Facebook page as well as our website. When you make a purchase using those links, 
we receive financial compensation, which also helps keep the show going. We really appreciate your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thanks for listening.